Amen. Thank you. That's good singing, wasn't it? Still the answer. Always has been. People have all new questions, but the answer's always... You know, the thing is, even the questions are the same. Really, uh, when you think about it, people are looking for hope. And uh, they'll do about anything they can do and follow anybody they need to follow to find hope. The problem is, they realize, usually too late, that uh, the person that promised them this hope can't deliver. And so the Lord always delivers. And I appreciate all that's taking place this morning. And if you would turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 this morning be familiar passage to you. Uh, we're going to begin in verse number 1 of Luke chapter 2. Uh, and talking about the birth uh, of hope this morning. You know, I, I see over and over uh, as we see the day of the Lord approaching. And by the way, He is coming, right? Right? Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the, the prophets prophesied that he would come. They weren't looking for him. Now we're in 2,000 years later. Uh, the Bible tells us he's coming again. And uh, you know what? We're not looking for him. And so uh, uh, the Bible says he'll come as a thief in the night. And so we, as God's people, should not be children of darkness. If you're saved, you ought to be looking for him, right? And so just as he uh, was prophesied in the Old Testament, he'd come the first time. Uh, in, by the way, in the Old Testament, uh, the prophecy of the second coming is in the Old Testament as well. Not only just the New Testament. So we have all this clarification and all of this uh, testimony that the Lord's coming. And yet God's people, let's be honest, we're fight, biting our fingernails down to the quick. And uh, we're nervous as a cat in a rocking chair factory about all that's going on in the world. And one minute we'll say we'll trust the Lord. And then the next minute we'll trust anybody else. And so this morning, what I think the world's looking for is hope. What you're looking for this morning is hope. And so the Bible tells us in verse uh, chapter 2 of Luke, and let's stand together. We'll read the first 14 verses of this chapter if you're able to stand. If you're not, you remain seated this morning. The Bible said it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Well, I like that, praise God. You say, why does that matter, preacher? Because uh, the Savior is coming out of, his prophesied, he's coming out of the lineage of David. And so you're seeing prophecy fulfilled uh, right there. And so uh, the Bible goes on to say in verse 5, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the Angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Now that's pretty good right there. Didn't say some, said all. Amen. And by the way, you're included in the all this morning. Uh, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And it shall, this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the gift of Jesus and thank you for the gift of salvation. And my prayer this morning is that there would be one person that does not know your Savior. Today would be that day for them. If there's one person following you far off, today would be the day that they get close to you and that fellowship is restored. And there's no doubt some here that are discouraged and downtrodden and, and need, to, uh, need hope as well. They know they're saved, but Lord, everything seems to be pointing in a negative direction. We all need hope today, and so give us hope from your word. And for everything and, the, and all that's accomplished today, we'll thank you and praise you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. 
we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Now I want to preach on the thought that the birth of hope. And I just mentioned, I think we would agree that that's what people are looking for. And, and uh, uh, we live in a day, let's be honest, uh, whether it's a government official or a religious leader or some new miracle drug uh, for someone who is very ill, everyone's looking for a message of hope. And they all leave us short. Listen, they may come out with a new cancer drug and it may work, it may not, right? And so we're looking for hope, but it seems like every time we find hope in something, it's gone. But we're looking in the wrong place. And so the birth of Jesus was the greatest gift given to mankind. Someone said this, if, if there was a cure for cancer, it would be the greatest gift given to mankind. No, the greatest gift given to mankind was Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And so he is the gift of salvation. We think, well, preacher, no, um, salvation is the greatest gift. You do realize Jesus is salvation this morning. Without him, there is no salvation. Without the hope of Jesus Christ, he is our he is our blessed hope. And so it was the birth of hope for a hopeless mankind. As you study your Bible and you know the Old Testament, you realize that there was such a period in the history of mankind where there was no hope. Matter of fact, when Adam sinned, there was no hope that man could be restored without a Messiah, without a Savior. And we look at the children of Israel. They were in bondage. They were looking for someone to pull them out of that bondage and they thought the Messiah would do that at that time and so they didn't see Jesus as a kingly Messiah and so they didn't want him and so today we're no different we want hope but we want tangible hope we want something we can touch and feel we want to see a bank account go up or we want the, the virus to be eradicated whatever it is and we're going we want to hope we want somebody that can fix all the problems and by the way let me say this the world's looking for that today and that's why it will be so easy for the Antichrist to come on the scene one day and offer the hope and solution for all this and multitudes will follow him because they're seeking hope but may I say today, is she just saying Jesus is the only answer to any problem you have, anything that you need hope for today, he is the hope that we seek. Amen. So Christmas should be one of the most glorious, exciting times for mankind. We ought to get excited about Christmas. Why? Because in the picture of Jesus in a manger, we see the manifestation of God's love to us. We see the picture of hope in Jesus Christ. So let us be reminded this morning why we should celebrate the birth of the Savior. By the way, it's not about reindeer and Christmas presents and it's not about Santa Clauses. It's not about frosty snowmen. By the way, I like frosty. But we get sidetracked on all that. And it, by the way, it's not about uh, getting together with family and giving presents and eating turkey and ham and all that. And, and those are okay. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. But if we do all that and we forget about the birth of Christ, we have totally missed what it's about. So this morning, what is this birth of hope? What did it mean? We see in the scripture, number one, uh, we see the miracle that took place. In verse one, came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Boy, he must, uh, uh, sounds like a lot of what's going on today, doesn't it? So here's what you see the business. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? We didn't come to get a business lecture from you. No, I want you to see God's business. What do you mean by that? Well, look what he did. The Bible used Caesar Augustus to tax the world. Now look at verse 2. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth. Uh, to, into Judea uh, which is called Bethlehem because he's of the house and lineage of David so God was using this wicked leader to get Joseph and Mary in the very place where it was prophesied that Jesus would be born you with me? so we're looking at a day where it seems like we're in a very godless society could we agree with that? I mean, I, I just saw this morning there's a company somewhere in the United States that, was that were making uh, dog tags for military guys that had religious messages on it. And because one person complained, uh, the military told them they couldn't make them anymore. One person. It's amazing to me. One person can't complain about something. They just say, well, we're not doing that anymore. 
Thousands of Christians complain. They say, oh, you don't matter, right? And so we live in a day, really, let's be honest, where God sometimes uses evil. God uses wicked men. God uses things that we don't understand, Brother Charles. It's not, if we wrote the script, that's not how we would do it, right? But here, God is using these leaders to tax people. And by the way, I don't think taxes are good, do you? But I want you to see what's going to come out of it. God was putting the pieces in place to fulfill the prophecy of the Old Testament. So when you get discouraged today, we live and say everything's going crazy and the world's going crazy and uh, uh, listen, uh, America's losing its soul and whatever. I agree with you 100%, but don't, don't get discouraged because God's still working things for his glory. He allowed attacks to maneuver people into the right place at the right time, right? So God will see to his plan, he'll see that his word is fulfilled. Listen to me. You want to have some great hope this morning? Won't you stop worrying about all that's going on and just follow Jesus? Mary and Joseph, as far as I know, they weren't writing their congressmen saying, I don't agree with this. They just went and did what they were supposed to do and went to pay the tax. And in that process, God used that to put them in the right place at the right time. Now you look and say, man, I don't have any hope and got all this stuff going wrong in my life and it seems like I go from one tragedy to the next and one trial to the next. You ever think that maybe God is using that to maneuver you in the right place uh, to do something great in your life? Because that's exactly what he was doing with Mary and Joseph. He was putting them in the right place at the right time. And you may not understand it, but God has a bigger view. He's got, the, he's got a better view than you've got of the whole picture. Amen. So this morning as you look say, I have no hope. I, I don't understand. I, if I only had this and had this and if I had money and I had a better job and if uh, America would uh, just uh, do this and we'd all be. No, listen folks, it's never going to be settled till Jesus comes back. And so you better find hope in him. This morning you see the, the business, but then I want you to see in verse 7 the birth. The Bible said, And she brought forth her, forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. So understand this. Your Bible in the Old Testament, if it reads right, says in Isaiah that he would be born of a virgin. Not a young woman. Amen. Young women can have children and not be virgins. The miracle of the birth of Christ was not that a young woman had a child, but that a virgin. Now, I'm not going into biology. I don't think I need to, do I? But you understand that for this woman to not know a man, it was physically impossible for her to have a child. But we see in the Bible that, uh, that the Bible said the Holy Ghost came upon her and so this was a holy child that was in her and so uh, the fact that he was born and the Bible said it was her first. Now if it had been her second, he wouldn't have been virgin born. So it's very clear that she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger. Why? Because there's no room in the inn. Again, Ladies, imagine with me, if you would, that you were riding on a donkey to this place called Bethlehem and you're going, Joseph, I don't really understand why I've got to go with you to pay this tax, but I'm going. And then they get down to the Holiday Inn and they go in and say, we need a room. The guy says, sorry, we're out. But you can go stay in the stable if you want to. And, and understand this, that the picture we have of the stable is probably a little inaccurate, not trying to nitpick, but you know, we, even in the, the manger scenes we see, they still looks pretty good. But Jimmy, most likely it was a cave. Now ladies, unless you're a big outdoorsman or outdoors woman, you probably don't want to sleep inside of a hill somewhere, right? But all that had to take place for Scripture to be fulfilled. And so God chose the place and the people. They went to the very place that the Old Testament said he would be born and to the very person, that virgin girl, that, Jesus, uh, that God said in the Old Testament would take place. Why is that all important? And again, I've said this a thousand times. Let me refresh you. 
Because in order for Jesus to be qualified to be the Savior of the world, he had to have uh, 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 pure blood. And we realize that because Adam sinned, that our, our attributes, our blood uh, type, different things are passed down through our father. And because Adam sinned, his children were sinners, and their children were sinners, and their children were sinners, all the way down until we get uh, to you and me today. We're sinners not because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We were born sinners. You need to get that because a lot of people, Brother Tim, think, well, I'm not that bad and I wouldn't consider what I do a sin. Well, the thing is, it doesn't matter if you consider it or not, God said this, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So therefore, when you drew your first breath, you were born into sin and you do, you commit sin because you're a sinner. And so if Jesus, if Joseph was uh, the, the father, earthly father, or the uh, the, the earthly father of Jesus, if he was his natural father, you and I could not be saved. There'd be no hope. I could choose anybody, man. I'd choose you to be my savior if that was the case because he wouldn't be qualified. But listen to me. Because he was virgin born. Because she had not known a man. Because he did not have an earthly father named Joseph. He had a heavenly father. He was qualified uh, to be born uh, in a manger to live a, a sinless life. To die on an old rugged cross in your place and mine. And God said, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied with the blood that Jesus shed. And now you and I have salvation because of the death of Christ. But it could not take place without the birth of Christ. You with me? So the miracle of the birth could only take place by God's supernatural power. You couldn't orchestrate all this stuff, right? I mean, let's be honest. Uh, there's not a man and woman alive that would t uh, choose an old cave to sleep in. Uh, they, they, but the fact is, that's where God brought him. Why was it? Because he wasn't born, listen to me, he wasn't born where everybody thought he's going to be born. They were looking for him to be born in a palace. He was born in a cave. He was born around regular people, right? Uh, he was bringing hope to all mankind, not just to the royals, not just to the wealthy, not just to the privileged, but the, the Bible said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm thankful, hallelujah, that he was born just like he was because he's, he's, he is available to common man so we see the miracle number two we see the manger the Bible said in verse 7 she brought forth her firstborn son wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger now I want to tell you what that had been kind of an awful place to have a child and bring him into the world didn't have the, ice, uh, the uh, uh, labor and delivery room then have him warm uh, those baby warmer things, right? Now I'm going to try not to get in trouble because the lady said, you don't know what it's like to get birth. What well, I'm saying is she didn't have a bed. All this took place because the Old Testament said it would take place. So what does that manger represent? Well, it, it describes the coldness of the world. It describes the coldness of the world. What do you mean? Well, the Bible said there was no room in verse 7 because there was no room for them in the end. No room. Let me ask you this. You got room for him? Do you have room for him? The world doesn't. The world won't seem out. They want to eradicate Christianity. They want to eradicate the message of Christ. They don't want you to pray. They don't want you to pray in Jesus' name. They don't want you to uh, uh, be a part. You know what? They don't want you to be a part of the school board meeting. We don't care what you Christians say. Now you have to separate church and state. Don't you know that? I know more than you do. They don't want us sharing our faith. They don't want the answer. They don't want us to give hope to a hopeless world. They want to eradicate Christianity so that uh, they can give an alternate hope. And so the fact is, uh, this morning as we look at the manger, it shows the coldness toward God's people too. But let me say this, in coldness there's still light. I like that picture they've been putting up, right? Here it is, this star shining down. You know what? 
when Jesus was born, brought light to the world. Guess what he did? He left us to be the light. Doesn't matter how dark the world is. Doesn't matter how bad America is. Doesn't matter how bad the world is. Doesn't matter about all that, folks. Listen to me. God left you here to be the light. Don't be cold and, 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 and push him out of your end. Right? Don't, don't put him out of your life. So the, it describes the coldness of the world, but it also describes the confusion of the world. All the events of the birth of Christ were prophesied. They didn't know it. They didn't think about it. Now, do you not think if they knew their Bible that they would have welcomed him in? They would have, listen, as we see the triumphal entry, uh, do you not think that's the way they would have welcomed Jesus in? I guarantee if they thought he was the Messiah, they'd have found room for him in the end. Now, let me ask you this. If, you, if he's Lord and Savior of your life, you're going to find room for him. He's not going to be in the back corner. And by the way, Jesus, I'll call you when I need you. If I need something in prayer. It's not going to be, a, a, listen, I heard this and I say it again. Uh, it, church ought to be a reason to, to miss other stuff. Not other stuff, a reason to miss church. Listen, folks. If we're going to serve God in this day, this is not a convenient serving God when I want to if I have time. If he is really who he says he is in your life or who you say he is in your life, if he's the Lord and Savior of your life, you ought to make room for him this morning. It shouldn't be uh, uh, people having to call and say, where are you at at church? Hey, missed you at church. Missed you at church. Uh, it shouldn't be uh, how uh, a preacher having to preach how you ought to live your life. If we love Jesus like we say we do, it ought to be important enough for us to love him all the time. Is he, is he a part of your life? No room for him in the world, but there was room at the cross. Number three, I want you to see the men in verse eight. The Bible said, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. They were sore afraid. Notice these men. You know what they were? They were faithful. They were faithful shepherds. They were lowly, right? I mentioned it Wednesday night, I believe. Those shepherds, being a shepherd was not a prosperous job. It wasn't what everybody wanted to do, was it? It was the lowest on the totem pole. If they had, if they had micro dirty jobs back then, they'd be one, right? Anybody want to be a shepherd? But did you notice the angel appeared to the shepherds? Didn't appear to the Pharisees. Didn't appear to the religious folks. Didn't appear to the king, the royalty. Appeared to the shepherds. They were faithful. Faithful in their responsibilities. God rewards faithfulness. It is required in a steward that a man be found what? Faithful, right? So faithful in obeying God's word. A lot of times we're looking for hope. And, and, and let's be honest, you know what happens? We'll say, I just don't feel like God cares. I don't see what God's doing. You're not going to unless you're faithful. It won't make sense. Here's what I found out. You can't do something, anything sporadically and be good at it. Agree with that? You can't, you can't be a hunter, right? Well, Kenneth... Uh, it, you see these guys making these long shots and killing deer. You're not going to shoot your gun once a year and be able to shoot like that. Right? Can't do it. You see these bow hunters, hours shooting an arrow into a target. Right? You see anybody that's good at anything, it takes time. What is that called? Faithfulness. You got to be that way serving God. It can't be when I feel like it, when it's warm enough, when it's not raining. Man, I commend you this morning. This morning it's raining. I was like, man, ain't nobody going to come to church today. It's raining. But you came. You're faithful. Now watch. If you wouldn't have been here this morning, if you would have stayed home, you wouldn't have been here to experience those kids blessing your heart, would you? Every time you come to church, God's wanting to do something for you. Every time you read your Bible, God's wanting to do something for you. Every time you pray, God's wanting to do something for you. Whatever it is God tells you to do, he's wanting to bless you through it, but you've got to be faithful. Now, this was not an exciting job to be a shepherd boy, but they were faithful in doing it, and they were rewarded because the angel came to them and told them that the Messiah had come. Now, this morning, as you... 
Look, you may not ever be a wealthy man, woman. You may not be a titan of industry. You may not be the most popular, but if you'll be faithful, you know what you'll be looking for? Jesus to come. So they were faithful. Then they were favored. Notice in verse 8 and 9, the Bible said, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them. They were so afraid. They were afraid, but did you notice this? Two things took place. The angel of the Lord came upon them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them. They got to see something. Amen. They got to see this angel of the Lord, and then they got to see the glory of God. Hallelujah. Amen. You don't have to understand it. Just be faithful. Be faithful in serving God. Be faithful in loving God. Be faithful. Be faithful. Be faithful. Or preach everybody's quitting. Everybody's quitting. Who cares? That has nothing to do with you. If everybody quits, be faithful. Why? Because God favors faithfulness. Amen? And so these, uh, these shepherd boys, they, they, God honors faithfulness. They experience God's love and they experience God's presence. They had hope. In a hopeless world, when they didn't have money, they didn't have fame, they didn't have anything seem going their way, Brother Matt, guess what they had? Hope. Why? Because God gave it to them that day. Now this morning you look and say, preach, you preach all that, but you don't know where I'm at. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't think God knows what you're going through this morning? But there's hope. There's hope, friend. There's hope. There's hope. There's hope. Why is there hope? Because Jesus is the answer. So number four, I'll give you this and I'm done. The message. Look at verse 10. The angel said unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Hallelujah. Praise God. Which shall be to all people. Not just to shepherds. He says it's for everybody. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. A savior which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Lying in a manger. That's interesting isn't it? Do you understand the miracle there? In verses uh, uh, 1 through 6. This is taking place over here. Right? Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem. There's no room in the inn. They're in a manger, right? All the way over here, while this is going on, this angel finds these shepherd boys. He said, hey, don't get too excited. It's just me. Don't, don't be afraid. i tell you what I'm going to do for you. I'm going I'm to tell you a secret. That's good, Baptist. You like secrets, right? I'm going to tell you a secret. Nobody else knows this, but I'm going to tell you. You go over there to Bethlehem, and there's, there's, a, there's a, a kid named Jesus. He's the Messiah you've been looking for. And here's where you're going to find him. You're going to find him in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. You ever put those two together? While this was going on, this was going on. It wasn't, by the way, Mary didn't send him a text message and say, let the shepherd boys know what's going on. You do, they didn't have text by then, back then if you didn't know that, right? You did. All this was God's plan. In other words, I don't have to know all that's going on on the other side of the world to know that God's doing some things, right? I don't have to know what's going on across the United States of America to know God's got a plan. I don't have to know the ins and outs of everything of everybody's business to know God's got a plan. I'm just trying to help you understand that if you'll get your eyes on Jesus and stop worrying about everything else and all the politics and uh, all the uh, whatever it is you worry about, you with me? Say amen like this. God will do some pretty amazing things in your life. And so the, the message is this. He said, there's a, there's a Savior born in the city of David, which is Christ the Lord. What's the message? I want you to see this, and I'm done. I want you to see it simplicity. He said, here's a Savior. Now, you don't have to understand all the ins and outs. and you, we, can, we can sit here and argue about everything in the world, right? We can argue the Bible all day long. You can believe this and I can believe this and you can find this scripture and you can, I listen to this guy and you listen. We can argue that all day long. But here's the simple fact. 
The simplicity of the message of the gospel is this. John 3, 16. Watch. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's simplicity of it. Well, how do I know, preacher? I mean, how do I know? Sometimes I feel this. And then, no, you're missing the simplicity of it. Salvation is very simple. Right? The message is simple. God loves you. Let me say it again. God loves you. And because he loves you, he sent Jesus to be born of a virgin, live 33 and a half years without sin, be qualified to die on the cross of Calvary in your place. You and I deserve to die. But the simple message is this. God loved you enough that Jesus died in your place. That's easy, right? Simple. Next, you see it's salvation. Salvation basically means to be saved. What will save you from your condition? She just sang about it. Jesus is still the answer. Today, Brother Kenneth, 2,000 years later, guess what? People are still getting saved the same way. Do you realize this morning, watch, do you realize that Mary had to get saved the same way that you do? So, well, wait a minute, preacher. Listen to me. She had to trust him as her Savior. Do you realize that Abraham saved the same way you are? The difference was he was placing his trust in someone that would come and die for sin. You and I are placing in our, our trust in someone that has died for sin. No, you look at me like, preacher, I ain't getting all this now. Jesus wasn't even born when Abraham was here. Jesus, I, I'm not getting all this. Man, they got some religions praying to Mary. Preacher, how can she get the same thing? She had to trust him. He's the only way. He's the only answer. He's the only one that died for the sins of mankind. Was Mary mankind? Sure. Was Joseph mankind? Absolutely. What about his brothers and sisters? Imagine that. They had to place their trust in him to go to heaven. No different today. Salvation. Jesus is the answer. He is salvation. I don't care if you've been baptized, dunked 47 times, sprinkled, held under water till you gurgled. That ain't saving you. You can say all the prayers you want to. You can put all the cards in the offering plate, shake every preacher's hand from here to California. That doesn't save you. You can be a good person, bad person, alcoholic, sit in a church all, your whole life, never drink, never do anything, You need any of those, but that doesn't save you. question this morning is this. Have you ever placed your trust in Jesus Christ? That's it. And I ain't talking about saying a prayer and then go live your life. I'm talking about every day. He's the reason. He's the answer. I will. Brother Jimmy, I can't go to heaven without him. Today, I got saved in 1996. That's when I asked the Lord to save me. Today, all these years later, I still can't go. I can't look back and say, well, I prayed a prayer. I placed my trust in him. If, if, I, if I go to heaven... It's because I have accepted the free gift of salvation and I trust Him. Right? right? right. Nothing else. Me praying didn't save me. Me trusting this. But when I pray, I am confessing. Right? With the heart, I'm believing. With the mouth, I'm confessing. So here's my question. Have you ever really, truly believed in your heart that he's the answer. That he is hope. That he is your savior. That you want him to be your savior. Because if not, friend, it doesn't matter anything else you've done. I talked to a man one time. He's telling me how many times he got baptized. I said, you know what? If you get saved, then baptized, once will be enough. Man, they don't wash any sins away. I put it like this. Heard old preacher say this. He said, if being baptized... Washed your sins away. He said when they let the water out of the baptistry, he said it'd go down the drain and it'd go into the river and the cow would drink the water that had your sin in it and then you'd eat the cow and you'd get it back. 
The blood's what washed sin away. And then finally, I'll give you this. I'm done. Watch this. It's satisfaction. What is the world looking for? Hope. Right? They're looking for something that will satisfy them. Their emotional problems, their uh, 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 mental problems, their physical problems, their spiritual problems, their financial problems. Every problem you got, somebody say, I need to answer for this. I can't have peace. I can't have joy. I can't have all this unless this problem's fixed. May I say this? You're always going to have problems. You can't take enough pills to get rid of your problems. You can't have enough money to get rid of your problems. But there is an answer. And it's hope. And his name's Jesus. And he loves you so much that he died for you. Can you, can you, well, how many of you, just be honest, I mean, how many of you, if you were him, would come and die for you? Look, I would, I would need to leave the splendor of heaven. To, to leave all that God has. I mean, Paul said this way. He said the half hadn't even been told. Brother Bart, I can imagine some pretty amazing things, but if he's telling me that whatever's in your mind, you're not even close to what heaven's all about. You're telling me that Jesus left that to come here to this awful sin-cursed world? For what? Because he loved you. And he died for you. Now the question is, will you receive him? That's it. That's too easy, preacher. Man, there's got to be some more to it. I've got to do something. Won't you give it a shot? What are you going to offer him? What about, what about money? He owns it all. He owns cattle of a thousand hills. Owns the hills. Owns the tater under the hill. What are you going to give him? The Bible said, the Lord said this, uh, that the earth is his and the fullness thereof. It's all his anyway. You're not going, well, I could, I could live better. There's none righteous, no, not one. I got to clean my act up before I come to him. Nah, he never asked you to do that. See, you're not going to be good enough to get to him, but he's good enough to get to you. All you got to do is come just like you are. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. You say, that's good, preacher, I'm going to do that. But I'm already a Christian. I'm already going to heaven. Well, why have you lost hope? You don't have any hope. You're discouraged, downtrodden, depressed, whatever it is. You know what? You lost hope. World's bad, preacher. Everybody's wicked. Not everybody. Oh, you know what, preacher? Listen, if God don't destroy America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Really? Because there's more righteous people in this room than there was in Sodom and Gomorrah. And by the way, God don't have to apologize for anything. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. He don't have to ask permission from you, me, the Baptist, or the Pope. Hallelujah. Won't you quit looking at everything else and you just look at you? And figure out what your issue is. Why you're discouraged and downtrodden and negative and never smile. No, whatever it is. whatever. He's the answer. He's the answer. You need him. And I need him. And he's available. Let's stand together. Let's stand. Thank you for your attention this morning. Let's bow our head. Close our eyes. No one's looking around. Miss Susan's going to come to the piano. Listen. Do me... Do this for me. This morning, if you are here and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're not sure 100%, not 90, 50, 89, if you're not 100% sure if you died this moment, you'd go to heaven. Do me a favor. Slip, slip your hand up and let me pray for you. I won't come to you. just want to pray for you. If I died right now, preacher, I'm not 100% sure I'd go to heaven. Would you pray for me? Would you do it? Just put it up and put it right back down. Maybe this morning you look and say, you know what? 
I'm discouraged. I'm downtrodden. Frankly, I'm depressed. Whatever it is, I need some answers. Won't you come let him be the answer? If you're not a Christian, you've never trusted him as your Savior, we'd like to show you how this morning. If in your life you say, my life's a mess, I need help, will you come so we can show you? Not our way, not a Baptist way, Bible way. What can help you? What will help you? Whatever your need, you come. Need somebody to pray with you? We got folks that love to pray with you.